I'm joined this afternoon um, by my esteemed colleague. I have Aiden, who's sitting right here. Wave at him, Aiden. I also have Amina. Amina's there. And I also have Jamie. Jamie's right there. So that, just so you don't get, you don't think it's like a sneak attack later, they're going to be coming up and joining us in a conversation. Here's what you can expect is, is uh, I'm going to provide you an informational slide deck. We can just have a little conversation. I'm going to talk at you for a few minutes. Uh, it's going to be like mad cool. You're going to be like, wow, this guy's really super cool. He's nice. He's really cool. He's attractive. Um, and at the end, but when it's all over uh, and all the smoke clears, you're going to have learned a little bit about, uh, you know, what our take on a little bit about media justice and some of the work uh, that that we're uh, aspirational about and some of the work that we've um, began to uh, endeavor uh, as the alliance. So what I'll do first is, is I will, you know, and this, this is the fun part because I, this, is, um, this is one of those things where I will, I will, I will struggle for a minute, uh, but, it's, but I, I got, there's, there's plenty of people in here who wish me well. Hmm? You can, you can, you can help. See, I was just going to say, there's people in here who mean well for me, and they, folks want to see me successful. So what I'm going to do is, is I am going to go, uh, you, is it HDMI? You got it? Yeah, what you need to do. Let's go. User groups, security, software, Bluetooth. You displays here. Displays. It's, it's so little. Arrangement. And then we're going to, I'm just going to mirror. You, you want me to mirror? This mirror is a lot more fun. Hey, looky there, looky there. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm not going to give you death by PowerPoint um, this afternoon. Um, everybody, give it up. No death by PowerPoint. I know you have eaten, cause I, I ate you. And that chicken was good. Yeah. So I know you've eaten, and so I, and what was that um, dessert? Was it like a donut? No, seriously. It was like, and it, and it had like applesauce on it or something like that. Is that what it was? Everybody's like, I don't know. I ate it, bro. So, I, so, so yeah, so we're going um, to get this slideshow. It's kind of, did it work? Did it work? This slide? Oh, snap. Look at that. Beautiful. Look what I did. I did that all by myself. So, um, yeah, you can clap for me whenever you want to. I noticed that the room is sparsely populated. Media justice is not a very exciting topic to, for most folks. It, it doesn't surprise me. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm, I'm an Iowa native. Don't look at me like that. I'm an Iowa native, uh, and I'm also a, a United States Army retiree. Uh, and I've, I've lived in about 17 states and four countries, and I've been in Vermont for the last 14 and a half years, OK? Um, I'm, a, I'm a recovering Republican. Uh, was I supposed to say that? Okay, I, I'm, I am. I uh, voted for Reagan in 84. Um, and I'm also um, a ordained minister in the um, National Baptist Convention, uh, and that's uh, ordained of 24 years. Um, I am a recovering cybersecurity professional and also a recovering computer, uh, a, a, a certified information systems auditor as well. So don't try to figure me out this afternoon, OK? Because I'll come at you from other directions. Uh, currently, uh, as I said to, uh, earlier, I am the executive director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. I'll tell you more about that organization in a minute, but you can check the mission out. It is pointed and it is intentional because that's how we do our work here in the state of 60, 640,000 people uh, in Vermont, where in which 1.5% are black. So the other thing that I'll tell you about the work that, um, that I'm doing, that, we, that we've been doing, is, is that it has a lot to do uh, with outreach and education, a lot to do with community engagement and support, a lot to do with platforms and initiatives, which is a fancy way of saying policy and stuff, uh, and cultural empowerment. And cultural empowerment, we can talk more about that later, but you can probably imagine. In fact, we, we started, you know, as we've driven this work, not only have we successfully implemented multiple statewide policies, uh, not the least of which is, is over the last six months, eight months or so, we amended the Constitution to abolish slavery. Why? Because our Constitution permitted slavery. Uh, so, um, so, and, and, it, and it goes all the way through the gamut of other 
other things that we've done. Cultural empowerment, really, we're, we're uh, playing off of a lot of um, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones. She happens to be from my hometown of Waterloo, Iowa. Uh, but we, uh, that 1619 project and that work there, uh, we're playing off a lot of that. Uh, and we, bring, we, we actually spit, spun up something called First African Landing Day, uh, which we do on an annual basis, and that's our flagship of cultural uh, empowerment. Now, media justice. So I, I, just, I put this up uh, on the screen because this is what some of you read um, before you came to uh, this session. Um, now, if, if there are those of you in the room who are as old as me, you may not remember why you came into this session. You may not remember what you read. I don't remember what I ate for breakfast this morning, um, but that's a whole nother story. So I just thought we would go back to that and have a conversation about it. Now, here's one of the things that I wanted you to, to think about today as we are going through media justice. And Megan, we have a session, we have a plenary on media, media justice tomorrow too, right? Which is gonna be awesome, so don't oversleep tomorrow. It's gonna be amazing because I met the vast majority of the panel members uh, for tomorrow. And let me tell you how this is gonna go down. I'm gonna tell you all about it right now. Everything you need to know about what's gonna happen, I'm just joking. So, I'm, so tomorrow morning, just show up and I, we'll talk more about it with a, maybe a little bit more of a slant. Now, when, when you think about, when I think about media, first of all, I want you to know that ACM is really, really new to me. And it's her fault <laughs> because our folks, our partners, our friends, our brothers and sisters at, at uh, CCTV here at Channel 17, uh, the relationship that we have with them, it kind of predates, actually it predates some of the work that I've been doing. I think I've known about Orca Media and CCTV and, and uh, the folks over on Flynn and Media Factory, Media Factory and other, way before, even before we started this work. However, um, you know, it's, it's my, my wife's, uh, her father, his name is Richard Kemp, uh, who, who sat on the board of directors there for years and years and years ago. Oddly, he did a lot of the things that I'm doing. Um, he was talking about things like abolishing slavery in the Constitution, uh, legalizing marijuana, and, and um, I don't know, just all, all kinds of stuff like reparations, for example. Um, so a lot of, a lot of work uh, was already being done, laid the foundation. He had, a, he had a program called Near and Far. Is that right? Near and Far? Uh, and the man is a legacy. In fact, we named our Cultural Empowerment Center, which was on the list. Some people came by and visited us last night, to answer your question. Um, if you came by and visited us last night, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yeah, I knew you put you on the spot. Um, Lisa, right? Lisa, it's good to see you again. So, so what, I'm, what I'm really getting after here is, is that um, there, are, um, there are some connections that we have with with um, public media, with um, media, um, community media, I should say, or PEG, if you will. I'm still learning the language um, that um, are, are pretty, pretty exciting. In fact, uh, one of the things that recently we did was is that um, they were writing a grant and they were like, hey, you guys want some stuff? Uh, so they called us, you know, we, we, we said, yeah, because we, we were looking for technology to kind of bolster some of the things that we're doing and wrote us into the grant. Uh, so, I mean, we're just, we're grateful, and I'm not, and I don't blow smoke very much, but I do want to at least acknowledge that we do have a, a you know, not just viable, but a, a really embracing partner, and we're, we're, we're going to be building more off of that. Um, when we talk about media, when we talk about media justice, I just want to frame the conversation, though, and, and I'm, I'm going to come back to that, but I want to talk a little bit about systemic racism. Ha, ah, gotcha. Okay, so, um, what, the reason why I want to do that uh, is because I'm, I want to frame where we're coming from because there are many, um, there are many, many media apparatuses that are looking for voices, and there, are, there, are, there are some voices that are looking for media apparatuses. So we're not, we're not, a, we're not, you know, just a media factory or a media outlet that's 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 looking for something to say. Is everybody following what I'm saying? So, so I guess I guess what I'm saying is, is we we showed up already with something to say. We got plenty to say. We have plenty of accomplishments. Um, in fact, you know what I what I said to um, to um, to Sarah Copeland Hanses, our state secretary, this morning is, is yo, um, we didn't hear from you. We're the preeminent racial justice organization in the state. We should have heard from you. And that wasn't blowing smoke because we are. 
Because th th that's the level that we're working at across the state. For those who, who are Vermonters, raise your hand. Get out of here. You guys are all Vermonters. Love ya. So for those of you who are Vermonters, you already know. You already know what the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance is doing. And if you don't, shame. Um, but take a look at this slide. And this right here, I left the book. I, I brought this book with me. And I left it in the car. <laughs> so this, this is Racist America. Joe Fagan and Kimberly Ducey. Um, there, you know, there's a lot of people talking now about, you know, especially since, um, you know, George Floyd and, and uh, um, Floyd and, uh, and uh, the pandemic. And I, I'm, I speak gingerly about the pandemic because it's still here. Everybody tries to tell me it's over, but it's, I'm, I'm smarter than that. So at that intersection laid bare for us, for everybody to see for the first time, it was right in our face. And if you missed it, if you missed it, then sorry about that. But if it was right in our face, we, it was all laid bare and, not, and it became clearer than ever that there, that there is clearly dis racially adverse and disparate outcomes that we are seeing across all systems. And so we're talking about an insidious nature, and we're also talking about something that is consistent at all times. Now, now a, a current um, mental health crisis exacerbating that is not helpful. But all I'm really getting at here is, is this is this is the, you know, the you know, a lot of people call it a concept. Some people call it a theory. In fact, some people even talk about it like it's critical. And it has to do with race, you know, and it's a theory. But if, but if we understand this, then we don't have to worry about a conversation on that. Because that conversation suggests that this doesn't exist. Process that for a minute. Because this is insidious and it's on all levels and it is a legacy of slavery. Now, I would have brought some other slides on this, and I think I could have, but I, I, I thought it would be good for me to hit this and keep it moving, but I can't stop here. Um, the reason is, is that at the, at the end of the day, sabotage, I call it sabotage. <laughs> so at the end of the day, really what it, re what it results in is, is that the median wealth of a white family is 13 times that of the median wealth of a black family in America. Hard stop. That's what it results in. Now we can talk about racially disparate outcomes across housing, education, employment, health services, economic development, transportation, the so-called criminal justice system. We can talk about all of that and I can show you all the numbers. Go to vtracialjusticealliance.org and look at the numbers yourself. We've got data folks too. We can talk about that and we could just say, well, you know, the black folks are just unfortunate. And it's unlucky. Name any snickets. They're not very clever. They're not good with their money. Or what all the other nonsense that we could talk about. But at the end of the day, after we get finished have, having these dumb conversations, what we're going to come back to is the fact that systemic racism is alive and well and it's impacting us. And this is a fact. This is not some of the, this is not one of those things that you need to that you are required to pivot around in your objectivity in reporting or covering because objectivity on this level actually does it a disservice Jimmy Hoffa is dead well some reporters say that Jimmy Hoffa has died come on he's dead There's no objectivity about systemic racism at all. It doesn't mean you don't have to believe it. It doesn't mean you need to believe it, but I'm telling you, it ain't going nowhere. It's right here, and it's hard to do something about. I, I wanted to share with you, yeah, I'm going to get after it. So I wanted to share with you about the United Nations, just something, a comment that the United Nations made. This is the, um, the um, racism and racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related forms of intolerance follow up to the implementation of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action. This is the, um, 
the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations. It's a statement that they made back in 2016. Again, I like the United Nations. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, um, an outside entity, kind of like a world referee, if you will, or something like that. I think they're helpful in the Middle East right now. Don't get me started. Um, but this is what they're saying about us. And every now and then, I think we, as arrogant Americans, need to stop for a minute and listen to what others are saying about us. How many people have lived outside of the United States? How long? Five years? Months. 10 years? I got 10 years, 13 okay? Years. 13. You trumped me, no pun intended. So, so here's the thing. We look stupid from the outside, don't we? And you can, you can see an American coming, all you gotta do is sit down for dinner. And don't get me wrong, I'm a United States Army retired, flag waving, God bless America, potato eating, so on and so forth. But still, it's important for us to listen to what's happening outside of the United States. They, they call it a crime against humanity. A crime against humanity. And they say that we must take reparative actions here in the United States for the Middle Passage. Why are you saying it? Well, you want me to talk about justice? I'm here to talk about justice. We might be talking about media justice, but we could e just as easily be talking about housing justice, education justice. We could be talking about health services justice. We could be talking about transportation justice. We just so happen to be at a media conference. And this is yet another one of those intersections. And I think it's important for us to be able to start the conversation in a place with a common understanding of when, when somebody that looks like me that's doing the work that I'm doing talks about justice, I'm talking about something else. Because really what we have to understand is we start on an, on an uneven playing field. That's where we start. So as we're doing the work, you know, as we're talking about as we're talking about media, as we're talking, I've heard somebody talking about uh, funding and, and because of the the um, I told you I was new to this because of the right of ways or because folks are not paying as much as blah, blah, blah. I mean, we're so far, uh, no pun intended, on the back of the bus. Those of us are like, we're coming over like there's money. Who owns this thing? Who's the operator? Where are all the black people at? So the challenge is, is you, with the legacy of slavery is, is the wealth disparities, the cultural disempowerment, the adverse and racial disparities in the, the gamut, um, and essentially the cultural erasure and appropriation. Now that's just something to process for a minute. Cultural erasure and appropriation. Because if we're gonna talk about media, then if we're gonna talk about justice, then let's talk about the challenge that we're trying to address. Because at the end of the day, the reason why I'm interested in ACM and the reason why I'm interested in media is because I need a mouthpiece. Because I need a megaphone. Because I need an amplification. Because I need access to something, to the technology, the people, the processes, the programs and the services that's gonna lift this voice up because I know it's right. No objectivity. So, we see the appropriation, we see the erasure, we see that systemic racism. See, there's something in it. This is a lovely thing. My mother used to say this all the time. Honey, there's something in it for all of us. <laughs> see, give some to your brother. They were, they were all older. I could not stand them, guys. Yeah, give some to your brother. There's enough to go around. So there's something in this for all of us, OK? Because at the end of the day, systemic racism directly impacts economic development, all economic development at the end of the day. Um, and, it, and I'm not gonna get too deep into that. Talk to me offline if that's not clicking for you right now. And the other thing is, is where injustice exists, where economic depravity exists, also comes instability. And where instability exists, there is no safety, there is no security. You see it in cities, you see it in towns, you see it in neighborhoods, you see it in states, you see it in countries. If there's no economic investment, you're not safe. That's what systemic racism does. So that's why it's so important 
that in media, that justice intersects with the work that we're doing. That's media justice. It, because we gotta be, we've got to be using it to, as a tool. We've got to be using media. We need to be providing access to media to folks who ordinarily wouldn't have access, providing technology to folks who typically wouldn't have access to technology, providing training and technical assistance to folks who normally would not, who, are ordinary, who otherwise would not have that, providing support to folks who ordinarily wouldn't have that, to p providing re report, and for, for, for those of you who are journalists in the room, to pivot off of your objectivity and do your analysis and report boldly. So there's a, there's a lot to be said about even democracy itself and what we see here as a nation that as a result of racism in this nation today, our very democracy is at risk today because of racism in our nation. And media is tied directly into that. So we are complicit in media with what's happening in our democracy today. Oh no, not me. Yeah, that's the problem, bro. Yeah, media justice, media justice. Media justice jeopardizes everybody. Everybody. So a lot of people that, that keep saying, no, you keep talking about systemic racism and, and, and where is it? You know, show me, some, show me some systemic racism. I ain't never seen no systemic racism. I get up and I go to work every day and I ain't seen no. And, and it's hard because, you know, especially those of you who are privileged. Yeah, I said it. So those of you who are privileged, of course you don't see no systemic racism. You ain't looking at, you ain't looking for it. It doesn't pay you to find it. It might, it might cost you to lose your privilege. And really, you're too busy benefiting. So, so yeah, I said that. You can beat me up after this. I'll stick around. I got a good right, too. Um, and here's the thing is, is that if you think about it, it's embedded in everything we do. I'm not going to go over this list. Just take, take a look at it yourself. Some of it is obvious. One of the things that I thought about one day, and I said it briefly this morning when Sarah was here, I said a, a woke black man, I said something like James Baldwin said that a conscious black man lives in a constant state of rage. And, and the reason why I said don't get afraid, don't be afraid. It's, I'm, I'm not going to go off today. I'm not. So it's okay. Everything's all right. But what I meant by that is, is that the more, you, the more you peel the onion on this thing, if you're, if you're honest with yourself, the more clearly you see it and the more evident it is in all things because it's the very fabric of who we are. And I remember one day I was sitting up and I was thinking about the city council meeting. <laughs> And these guys are like, yeah, you got, you know, here's the public comment period. You got two minutes to tell us what you want. And we're just going to sit here and look at you and we don't have to respond. But you only have two minutes. And if we don't want to talk to you, we'll go into executive session. I said, what the hell is this? I start thinking about Robert's rules and I know Robert's rules. I start and I start. But again, I'm a recover. Never mind. But the, the point is, is just that, you know, there is so much in the fabric of who we are. So I, I just want you to stop and think about that. You know, I mean, don't get me started on the Electoral College and, and the filibuster and, and gerrymandering and all that other nonsense. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, journalistic objectivity, and then I'm going to ask my guests to come up in, in, just, in just a second. Um, and I'm, I'm stuck on this because I, I got, um, what happened was is um, as I started to do the research on um, on who we are, and we're gonna we're gonna have some time for questions and comments too. I think we're going until four four forty five five three thirty three thirty five fifteen four forty five four forty five. She said six. Five fifteen. It's five five fifteen. So um, so I'll slow down. Huh. So um. So here's, here's the thing. I started thinking about um, the whole idea of uh, media justice. And, and, and Megan and I were talking, and then we, we, got, we got the group in 
that was going to be on the panel tomorrow. And I was kind of suspect of that uh, because I'm thinking, oh, I see the, you know, these folks, the, you know, the folks who are privileged with the power, the folks who are running this conference, they want to bring us onto a call and kind of like plant some stuff, plant some seeds with us and hear what we're thinking so they can kind of like figure out how to navigate. I mean, I'm, I'm a conspiracy theorist too, and I'm probably half of it's right. But that's not the point. The, the point I'm making is, is that um, there's, there is a, a lot to unpack. And I got a lot out of that call. And it got me thinking. And, and I started to think about how many people heard of As Seen on Radio? As, put it in your phone. Just put it as a, mark it as a podcast. There are four seasons. Is As, S-C-E-N-E, As Seen on radio. And there's there's one about uh, being white. I think it's like season one or season two. And then this one is, is the America that never will be or never has been or something like that. They we're in season four. And there's a section on um, on media. And I just heard it this morning and, and it confirmed uh, what it is that I'm talking about here. And they're talking about journalistic objectivity and just what a farce it is, uh, especially in, in topics like this when we start talking about justice. But um, I, I, I got a chance to process a few things. And there was a quote that I heard somewhere, and they said that journalistic objectivity um, is the ideology of the status quo. Journalism objectivity is the, it is the, is the, it is the ideology of the status quo. Who decides what's normal? Who decides what's acceptable? Who decides? I mean, when, when your editor or, or, or who's ever editor, whenever, when somebody is reviewing uh, something that's been broadcast or, or that's being broadcast, who's, who makes the decision to say, you know, that's a little bit too much opinion? What you just said, you know, you, you, just, you, know, you just made a leap of logic. And what you're doing is you're forcing your opinion on somebody else. Who has that power? Who? I'll bet you they don't look like me. I'll bet you they don't look like me. Because what, what we have is, is those, those folks whose stories that are believed, those folks, yeah, I can sit here and talk to you for two hours and some white guy with political and economic power can come in here and talk to you for two minutes and you will leave out of here believing every word he said even if he told you I was a liar. And I'm telling the truth. Who has the power? So who's making those decisions? I assert that as a journalist, that journalists are activists. I assert that with my knowledge, with anybody's not with, with the knowledge that a journalist has, Say, for example, I just gave you a crash course in systemic racism. Do you believe it? Whatever. But what, what, for those of you who do, that should inform anything you learn, anything you know to be true should inform your analysis in whatever it is you're evaluating to report in journalism. There is an analysis that journalism deserves. And when we report on anything, and we do so totally objectively, and we ignore what we know to be true, then what we're doing is we're perpetuating that system of oppression yourself. I'm going to say you are a racist. When you know something to be true, and you're hiding behind objectivity, which I think was the name of the program, that we actually won the award on in Brooklyn. It was called Hiding Behind Objectivity. That was the program that we were given the award for when we were down at Brick in the summer. Um, when you do that, when you do that, all you, what you're doing, you're, first of all, you're doing journalism a disservice. Secondly, as an activist, you're doing activism a disservice. Thirdly, the, the folks who are oppressed, you're doing them a disservice. Lastly, you're making yourself look stupid. To sit here and look at me and say, oh, you know, 
Let me talk, think about this objectively. Sit down. You're no journalist. Journalism is activism. And we must be informed by the things that we know to be true. And if you know something is true and you're reporting around it, you're pivoting around it as if it's not, then you're saying that truth is not true. And we wonder how there can be an alternative, an alternate reality or an alternate truth. It's because, it's because we're doing that. Because as, as journalists, that's, that's what's going down. Objectivity, when we start talking about media justice, objectivity is a myth. So says I. So says I. Consider it. I'm not going to beat you over the head with it, but consider that. Objectivity is a myth because, because for those of you who don't, who are still looking at me crazy, it's because you are privileged. Because, because you are a white person in a white dominated country where all the laws are in favor of whiteness and you have the audacity to sit here and look at me and think that I'm crazy telling you about this? Objectivity is a myth. It's a myth. Yeah, this is media justice. Mm-hmm. This is media justice. So this is something, this is where it all comes together, at least in my mind. We can talk about access all day long. We can talk about, you know, other aspects of it in terms of um, how do we, how do we bring, how do we pipeline a, a, um, a cadre of, of, um, of media, of, of activists who, um, who have interest in media. I didn't say media folks who have interest in activism. And how, how, do, we, how do we train them? How do we equip them? And we were talking about generally from marginalized communities. How do we provide them the access to the technology, to, to the resources that they need to put and position them to support organizations and activists in, or organizations like ours? and folks who are doing other stuff in the LGBTQIA community, in the dis disabilities community, so on and so forth. How do we equip them? How do we make that happen? And I think, um, I'm glad you asked, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the stuff um, that we are envisioning and also some of the things that we've already, um, that we've already um, started. But before we do that, and as they come up, I want to um, just you know, start a conversation. Y'all can we just go ahead and come up with, come, I know you're kind of shy. It's okay. It's okay. Y'all just as cute as ever. What up, bro? What up, sis? How you doing? These are my people. <clears throat> um, before we get started, I, I wanted to, um, I'm going to introduce y'all in a minute again because you guys look so good. You guys are, I love teenagers. Don't y'all love teenagers? Yeah. I love me some young folks. <laughs> they can't stand me. So um, the, um, the thing is, is that um, instead of being talked at, it's, it's good because I just, I laid some heavy stuff on you just now. I laid some heavy stuff on you. So before we get into this case study, um, my thing is, is this, is I, I want to hear from around the room, and this is, what I know is, is that there are some people in the room who are never gonna say a word. And one of my activist buddies tells me, he says, there's always one. I don't worry about who the people, the person who speaks up. Um, I, don't, I don't worry about anything. Um, but um the what what I do pray more about is 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 that there's people who you just never know where they are. You never know where they are. And we can't fix that, but I do wanna say if that's you, if I'm talking to you. If, if you're staring right through me right now or crossing your arms or something like that, um, just know that um, there's going to be space, there's going to be a place for y'all for y'all offline. It's like for after this session, uh, when this is over with, I'm going to stick around so we can talk. I'm going to give you my card, my email address. We're going to cultivate a relationship. We're going to talk. talk with you. And there's 20% 20, 20 of the people in the room. You're untouchable anyway. There's nothing I can say to you. There's 20 people, 20% 20 of the people in the room still trying to figure out why I'm telling you this again. And then the rest of you, you know, you guys are really interested. And that's great. But I do want to have a conversation and, and just kind of disarm everybody in the room. Because look, 
At the end of the day, first of all, we're not going to do this in our lifetimes. This is very difficult work. I'm talking about activism. I'm talking about eradicating systemic racism. It's not going to happen in our lifetimes. Everybody in this room who's white either has been or has a racist in your family. Get over it, okay? Welcome to America, okay? This is how it is, okay? There's no white person in this room that hasn't silently witnessed black oppression. Forget about it. Stop talking about it. Stop trying to convince me that you're not a racist. So, that, for, so erase all of that, and let's just get down to business about what we do in journalism, and what we do in media, and how we provide access, and how we lift marginalized communities up, or what we envision that looking like, and how we can be productive collectively in making that happen. What are some of the experiences that you've had that you've seen? What would you like to see? What makes you feel good about what we're talking about? Understanding that in order to get this done, listen, in order to get this done, as far as the work that we have to do, we're only, listen, we're only talking about media. We're just talking about, we're not talking about housing or education or employment or health services access or economic development or transportation or the so-called criminal justice system. We're just talking about media. So, I mean, we should be able to, we should be able to have a conversation as professionals about some of our thoughts and ideas some, about some of our desires and aspirations and understanding that the work that we do is going to be almost meaningless unless we comport it to a lifestyle and not manage it like a project. That, that we come to understand that if, 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 what we're, if what we're looking at here is really true, I think it is, and we're committed to doing something about it with media, through media, by media, and we are media professionals, then we have to understand that there must be a transition, a transformation in how we do things from this day on. If we want to make a difference, we choose to live our lives differently. That's what we do. We choose to live our lives and understand that this is, this is not a destination. This is a journey. So we're going to go together. So what are your thoughts on, and, and what, can anybody give me an example, any thoughts about media justice in general, but examples of where you've seen it implemented or how you'd like to see it implemented in the work that you are doing? Oh, I got three hands at one time. Oh, I'm out of here. That's it. You guys want it from here. No, I'm going to go to you first. Can we it, just can we get a mic to to um? To, no, there's no there is no mics in the room. There's no we have no. Okay, so I'll just repeat you. So media representation, media representation. So can you unpack that a little bit? We, we got time. People walking through the door that represent what people like that looks like. Yeah. Looks like, and there's like tons of barriers to that. What is your name? Danny. Danny. I work at the Vermont Justice Project. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah. Oh yeah, we met. We met. Yes. We met. I remember you. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, yeah, there, yeah, there's a lot of barriers in the way that are, there might be workarounds. Lots of barriers in the way there might be workarounds. Uh, there are trying to get there are workarounds. Trying to get people in the door that that look like look like me. Look. You know, who else? Who's else's hands up? You look so much like Peter. Doesn't he look kind of like Peter Hirschfeld? <laughs> he does. Uh, I'm sorry. What's your name? Do I, do, do I know Peter Hirschfeld? <laughs> he's, 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 he's an awesome person. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's an amazing okay. person. Yeah. 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 He must be a really he's good a reporter on, on, public, on Vermont Public. Oh, gosh. Gotcha. I'm, I'm Bert. I just I work in um, uh, GNAC TV over in Southern Vermont. So nice. I just Bro. had a question about it. You know, I grew up as a, uh, you know, upper middle class, white American, mm. looking the way I do. Boo, boo, I know, yes, but, yes, yes. But watching, <laughs> watching, you know, James Bond reading superhero comic books and thinking to myself, I'm going to be an action hero one day. I'm going to be a, 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 somebody that gets on TV and does stuff and does all this stuff. 
So my question is, uh, and I just walked into the door and did it mm. um, because I had that history. How do we empower marginalized communities to have that same kind of confidence mm. going into a, a media, a, a media uh, thing? Because I don't see very many people volunteering to jump on board. Uh, I see mostly white men, to mm. be honest, mm. so, um, that are, are volunteering to be on TV or volunteering to be in these in these things because that's who we've seen for the majority of, mm -hmm. of our life. That's what I grew up, grew up watching. So how do we encourage a community to, 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 to jump on and, and be on it? How can we do that? So is it, it's Bert, right? Yeah. It, is, is the question more like, um, how do we encourage uh, the black and brown community to engage in media? Yeah. yeah. Okay, given the fact that we don't really see a lot of representation there. Yes. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just like cut around the edges just a little bit, uh, and then I want, I want to turn the, I'm gonna turn it to the, to the room. So if there's something that you have that you'd like to come back with, you know, it's gonna be open. Um, so there are. Um, There are a lot of social um, challenges in the black community. Um, you will see um, children being born out of wedlock. You, you, you'll see the incarceration rate um, as far as um, disproportionate uh, contact with law enforcement officers, economics, um, the, and, uh, and um, yeah, there, and, and there's, you know, expulsion rates, suspension rates in schools, and, and the list goes on and on. And I think it is really easy to, um, to get cause and effect mixed up to understand what came first. First of all, we are a nation who's only been, who's only had f true freedom for black people in all of our history, for 50 years. 50. That ended, that everything allegedly ended with the Housing Act of 1968. Right around the time MLK was assassinated, many cities were burning, some, some, some of you were there. The Kerner Report was shelved. How many people know what the Kerner Report is? The Kerner Report was shelved, and we elected Nixon, and we started a war on drugs. So 50 years is all black people have had in this nation of freedom, and that has been taken off the table. Thank you, supermajority, United States Supreme Court reverse discrimination, 14th Amendment, equal protection. So we are riddled with challenges as a nation and what we see often, uh, the reason that we don't see, like say for example, folks knocking the doors down. I had, I had seven, seven interns and I invited all of them for the summer. I, two white young men, five black, five black young women, okay? Of those, this is the only guy that showed up, okay? Because he was able, and I'm grateful. So, but the point I'm making though is, and I'm gonna turn it to the room, is, is that part of the reason why we're not seeing folks lined up, did I mention that my data team was white? I've got a robust set of data out there. I've got a trans woman who's right here in Burlington who's been with me for two and a half years, and I've got a cis, male, retired white guy that lives down in Queechee. And I, then I've got, well, there's, there's more, but I'm just saying, we don't have black data people. And you start asking, is it just because they don't have a desire? What's the room think? Raise your hand if you got some thoughts. They don't know about They don't know where to go. They don't know where to go? They don't know where to go, that's the thought. All the way in the back. The opportunities are out there. The opportunity's not out there, okay? I thought I was looking no, at you. I, I just say access, to <coughs> access to education. What else? 
Systemic racism says that black people don't do math. Systemic racism says that black people don't do rap, math. And, and when in a system, you also have a system where you, if you take, I was sitting down with Sparks from, from, uh, from the Burlington School District. How many people know Sparks from the Burlington School District? Okay. He's, he's the DEI guy. He's been around for like 30 years. Um, again, we do work across the, the entire spectrum. Um, the racial disparities in the criminal juvenile justice system advisory panel, we, we developed, we created that, we architected that. So I do spend a lot of time talking to folks from DCF, talking to, and what we see is, is that the numbers, the numbers, you look at race traffic stop data, the numbers, the numbers, the numbers, when you look at the, you know, as, as youth are going into um, the, um, the juvenile justice system and crossing over into the, the criminal justice system, they're doing so in, you know, much larger numbers. Black young men are doing so in much larger numbers. Aiden, you probably would agree when you look at folks getting kicked out of school in Burlington. Um, much larger numbers. So I think there's, there are, it's complicated. It's on a lot of different levels. Um, when we, you talk about, we talk about what the pandemic laid bare for us or last a few years ago. School shuts down, no problem. Go home and do your homework. You got a computer? Nope. Who doesn't have a computer? Well, the median wealth of a white family is 13 times that of a, of a black family. Who do you think doesn't have a computer? Oh, here's a computer. Well, how am I going to get on the internet? We don't have any internet access. So this 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 manifest this plays this plays out on a lot of different levels. Sometimes it just has everything to do with just, and, and if you can trans, if you can comport this to how it is you do your job and what it is you see and how it is that you're currently engaging media justice on your front, then I think you might get some gold, we all, it's not just to you, but we all might get some golden nuggets out of what we're saying. Well, how are we gonna announce it? You heard Sarah say something this morning. I had no freaking clue what she was talking about. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. Are you kidding me, Sarah? Oh, well, Mark, that's arrogant. So the, the thing is, is that you can't just put that thing on social media or you can't just say, oh, it's on Front Porch Forum. Who looks at Front Porch Forum? <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're an anomaly. So, so there's... Um, so I want to introduce this group, um, and then we can we can um, move on because we've got we're running. You know what? Before we introduce y'all, oh, I got a cash app notification. Um, before we um, before we uh, go on, I'm going to give you all an opportunity to introduce yourselves. I, I didn't tell you. I didn't tell them I was going to put them on the spot. But all you got to do is just say your name and and whatever anything else you want to say, if anything at all. Okay, and we're, we'll start with Aiden. Hi, I'm Aiden. I'm Mina. I'm Jamie. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm really proud to, to have these folks on. I'm, 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 oh, I'm sorry, Jamie. Go ahead. Um, I don't know what to say. You can say whatever you want to say. Tell us, tell us something to say. Uh, you want a prompt? Yeah. Okay. So. This is good because I've been thinking a lot about having y'all on, and I'm really excited that y'all are here. Um, and um, you've just, all of you have just began to learn, and you've you, you just learned some things just sitting here. And we've also been doing some talking amongst ourselves. And you've had some exposure uh, to some of the things that we're doing technologically as well. Um, so generally speaking, what do you, you know, what are the biggest in your in your in y'all's opinions, I'm trying to figure out what's the biggest thing that you believe is holding you back to have access to media. What it, what is it that you need in order to to um, you know to, to you know to be impactful to, to be able to get your voice out there? We remember we talked about how the the term the the whole idea of voice is what you have to say. Uh, in fact, it goes all the way back to the whole idea of the word vote. When you think about voice, so your voices, all y'all's voices are incredibly important. And, and media is the key. 
um, in historically you haven't really had you know an equitable opportunity to have access to media. Um, we're going to talk about social media in a minute, so I know you guys are itching to talk about that. But I just want to hear more about what you think might be holding y'all back or what you think could be. Um, would, I guess, would you, what do you believe would be helpful if, like, if somebody was standing there saying, OK, you just tell us what you need and we'll give it to you. Well, how would you answer that? Uh, we can start with Aiden and just go down the line. And you guys can just interrupt each other and argue and like you always do. Uh, I don't really have any social media, so. No, it's not just social media, just, uh, just, 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 just media capabilities in general. Uh, everything from recording to, produ to production to broadcasting and all of that. Yeah, I can't think of any like actual resource I have that would like, allow me to like go and like, set up production and you know, mm -hmm. just have access to that technology. Like, mm -hmm. At least growing up in Wilmington, like I've never had access to that really. You know? I mean not that I know of. <laughs> There's something if you let me know, but mm -hmm. I've also never had an interest in it until now, so that's also so you grew up, Amina, you grew up here in Burlington. No, I didn't. He's my grandma. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they, but they didn't know you grew up in Burlington. Right? I grew up in Burlington, yeah. I was born here, and yeah. I'm your grandfather? <laughs> yeah. I thought you were asking me, like, you didn't know. No, I was just, I wanted you to tell them, though. Oh, yeah, I, grew, I was born here, lived here my whole life. Like, she treats me badly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you oh, did you want to say uh, something? Yeah, I'd say public access to uh, media sources. Media sources. Okay. What does that mean? Uh, kind of like CCTV. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, we're, yeah, we're totally. Yeah, we're gonna totally talk about that too. More? You, did you have more to add to that? Okay. Jamie, what are you thinking? Um, actually, just the other day with my school, I went on a field trip to Media Factory. What? Over there, remember? Oh, yeah, and I think that's a really good place to kind of get into, because it's hard to like, those equipment is very expensive, so you can't yeah. just cultivate that. Mm -hmm. So having places like that is very important mm -hmm. and good. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, and, and I think um, there's, I think there's much to learn about some of this stuff. Remember I told you guys that I was just learning a lot about this? And I think there is a, um, help me out, there's the public piece, there's an education piece, there's a government piece. Is that right? How am I doing? Yes. Well, that's the way the federal government defined it, but it's, <clears throat> it's community. So, but it's all community. That's what we call it. Community. Yeah, so what I, one of the things that I was trying to do is just kind of fit a square pig in a round hole because I was, I was thinking, well, where do we, you know, where do we, what is, you know, what, where do we come out at now? Of course, the, um, the, um, the public side, wait a minute, let me see if I can get this right. The, the government side is you, right? Is that correct? We, we call ourselves a small G government access. Okay. So we are getting, we are both. Can you government. tell everybody in the room what, I mean, does everybody know where, that she's CCTV? Everybody does? Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, and so when I work at CCTV and they're going to work, and as we call ourselves a, we're, we're from more of the tradition that Randy's really talking about, about our access center, CCTV, existed before we had the uh, community media center arm. Yeah. So we were a community media center in the tradition of using media to connect people and to mm. make our communities better whole places. It's not media for the sake of media at the end. It's media for the use of, um, you know, making our world a better place, really. Um, and it just uh, it, it just came out the other day uh, when somebody was in, um, I think it was you, 
Richard, who was in, pointing out how our studio was built, and I don't know if you want to talk about that, the open studio concept and why. Let's um, let's do this. Let's come back to that. I want to hear a little bit more about um, okay. I want to hear a little bit of, more about your trip over to Media Factory first, and then I'm going to go to the case study, and then we can get to that and more when we open it up out here. Okay. Um, so we went to Media Factory, where at my school. I go to Horizons through BHS. It's an alternative program, and um, we went. We're doing podcasting things at my school, and we just got equipment. So we went there to kind of learn more about podcasting and how that works and learned about like mics and stuff and saw all the equipment they have there. Um, I personally am a singer, I like to sing. And so that kind of interests me because they had like nice. the booth and nice. yeah. So. Did you record anything? No, but I got to go in and like test it out and stuff. Nice. So yeah. Can you want to sing something for us right now? I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell y'all a little bit about um, what we were able to do over the summer uh, with the, um, with the um, and this is the case study that, that I brought you. Um, there was um, some conversation, and these, these folks, I said it was five young black women and two young white dudes, and, but they all went through the um, Racial Justice Academy as instructors, is that right, together? Um, so I brought them all in and interviewed them at the same time to find out um, you know, who was, I was going to actually hire. So I just hired all of them and because I couldn't not hire one of them. I was like, come on. So um, it was probably like seven or eight weeks over the summer. We, and it was some great work that they were doing. Again, we're operating through this, this, uh, this, this lens that we're here to address systemic racism. What are the biggest issues? You know what they, t they said the biggest one was? Mental health. Mental health. Mental health. So, so there's there's a lot of a lot of work that needs to be lifted up, that needs to be amplified, that needs to be that needs to be in the ether out there. That's so important. Again, we have we already have a vision and a mission. We already have an objective. We just need a voice. We need to lift it up. We need to lift it up. So that's why you know we rely on um, CCTV. That's why uh, we we also are um, expanding on our own infrastructure as well. Um, we we also I also personally believe, and this is going to be true across all you know all social determinants of health, because at the end of the day, there will be instances where um, we identify, for example, like housing. We, we see that uh, there's a housing, is there a housing shortage in Vermont? Duh, right? Well, guess who's at the epicenter of it? We're hit first and worst and it, it lasts longer. That's in everything. That's by definition of systemic racism. So what we know is, is hey Mike Monty, so we're having conversations and we're, we're at CHT and we're trying to nudge certain programs and services that they're offering to, to tweak them to be able to make them more accessible to black and brown folks, for folks who are poor economically, trying to make them more visible because maybe you're just announcing them in the wrong places, or maybe you haven't really focused on the real needs of the black community so they don't find those programs as interesting or useful. So we're helping there, but at the same time, we're creating our own programs and services within our own community, within the Richard Kemp Center, some of them that are housing related. So that's by black people, for black people. It's got a ring to it, right? It's, it's really important that at some point or another, we got to figure out how to, as you just said, Bert, how do we empower ourselves? So that's what the Kerner Report said, is, is, is that we, there needs to be an investment in our communities, an investment. And I say that like that because at the end of the day, everybody wants to talk about everything, explore everything, kick the can down the road. But when it comes down to talking about putting money in black communities, that's where the bus stops. <laughs> Whiplash. Because at the end of the day, 
we shouldn't have to depend on the schools to create programs to visit Flynn at the media factory just so our kids can get exposure to this technology. We shouldn't have to go over to CCTV just so our kids can be exposed to this technology. I have a vision, we deploy this technology at the Richard Kemp Center. And it doesn't mean we don't go to the media factory or CCTV, but we first have our own. We have our own. And we can go on down the list with every single social determinant of health where, we, where we're going to be most effective is when we invest in black communities, we stand up black, because there are talented black folks in our community who do have the aptitude to do this work and are interested in doing it and will do it if they were empowered to do so. But they're not necessarily going to show up at CCTV or the media factory to do it. Why? They may not want to work with you. So again, how do, we, how do we get after this? One of the ways we get after this, invest, 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 invest in black communities, okay? So, so we definitely went over, we went over, this is great. We went over to CCTV a couple times. Uh, we took seven youth over there and they tore the place apart. No, not really, but, but it was a blast. Um, and Aiden, you were, you're the only one on the panel who was there. I'm, Wonder if you might want to speak to the two trips that y'all took over there. Uh, we worked on a podcast called. Actually, it was a. It was a show. We made a couple episodes called Life at BHS, and we talked about what it was like at BHS. Right. The school being an old mall. And one of the things that we said was it's challenging not having windows and. <laughs> like. The, Is that how you said it? <laughs> yeah, we also said that the walls don't reach the ceiling. So it's kind of like all the teachers are yelling at the same time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What else? Oh, uh, yeah. Not everybody knows that Yeah. 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 So I just graduated from there. Um, and we both in the factory. Yeah, we both in the factory. Um, well, actually, you must be the first girl, so you can explain the difference. Okay. Well, I went to the original VHS, um, and it was different because it was an actual high school. Like it was <laughs> nice. It was an actual building. We had all the buildings, and we had our cafeteria and we had our gym and we had all that stuff um and then obviously we switched to online and then we went to this right over there and um yeah it's a lot okay why um there oh there was like chemicals in the like yeah yeah um and it was apparently giving kids like nosebleeds and migraines and um it's kind of like it's kind of scary to think about because like my grandma went there so it's like generations and generations of people that were in that building um breathing in those harmful chemicals so it's like kind of like it makes you think a little bit but um yeah it was because there was a bunch of chemicals in the foundation i think that one of the things that i saw when i was because i was in the studio when they were over there is is that they're how many people have been in CCTV? Okay, so you, so you know, you go in there and um, you, you see the, uh, the set and then you also see the control room back there. And um, so just imagine there's seven youth and then first we sit down, we have a conversation about the origins of, um, of uh, community media. Um, and uh, we, we start talking about, you know, why why it's so important, why, why this project, if you will, is, is so important and how, uh, on some level, it, it kind of, um, or it could potentially level the playing field on, on some, in some ways. Uh, and and we, we just got into this huge conversation about voice and about how, how not only this is just an opportunity, but this is not a, a, um, but a responsibility 
you know, for us uh, to leverage to the best of our ability. What is going on yeah. up there? Um, and, and so then some of them ran over to, I got it. Some of them ran over to the control room and they put the headsets on. Some of them went, I'm sitting at this desk. And the others, some of them got behind the cameras and they went after it. And it did like two or three rotations. And, but they were chatting it up the whole time. Try, okay, what are we gonna do with it? It was just amazing to see them because before we went down there, to me, they were kind of lukewarm. Yeah, you guys, you guys were pretty lukewarm. You guys, yeah, you know, well, yeah. Um, but just to see everybody light up down there and just to, to go after it and, and, to, and, and to do something together. And they were real, you guys were really nice to each other and it, it was just a lot of fun watching you. So I just wanted to bring that out. The other thing that we were able to do um, was is, you know, I mentioned some equipment that we do have at the Richard Kim Center. For some of you who were there yesterday, you saw that we were set up and we were, um, we were actually shooting something down there yesterday. Um, but I, you know, again, just took the group of them and just crossed my arms and said, we need to set up for a hybrid. Let's go, right? So started talking to everybody through how to set the equipment up. And they just, they, they got, you know, I explained to them what was what and what did what and why it was important. And then we got towards the end. Um, we, and we also had a technical problem. We had a bad cable. So we even had some opportunity to do some troubleshooting. And it was a blast uh, to see uh, the youth do that. Um, and and what, that did, what that did for me, what it did, this whole process, what it did for me, because of course, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance and the Richard Kim Center, we, we you know, it's, it's very important that we have the apparatus that uh, an effective, a in, incredibly powerful uh, and uh, seamless apparatus that will allow us to be able to uh, pivot at any given time and to be able to provide broadcast capabilities, recording capabilities, studio capabilities. We, we need to be able to, we need, to, you know, one of the things that I learned in this business that, that, that it, at least it seems is as if it's pretty, it's good. Same thing in the military. Drill sergeant walks in, everything looks pretty, they leave you alone. It looks like it's not so pretty, start ripping things apart. So I think one of the things that I'm excited about is, is that we've, we've, we've got this opportunity. I, I, see, I see opportunity for us to, to get resources. I see opportunities for us to, to get funded. Um, you know, I, I, I think I could probably sneeze and raise $50,000 um, for, for something like this. And I'm not just blowing my horn. Who says that, right? You know, nobody says that. It's like, you, usually it's like, please give me my, no, we can, we can do this. And I, I know that even some, there's, there's probably even some folks in the room, and I know that there's folks in the room who are gonna have an eye on what we're doing at the Richard Kim Center, and you too can be a part of that as well. But this, this, um, this case study, um, definitely, um, what it did was, is it opened my eyes. Um, to the extent that I reached out to Champlain College, how many people know about Champlain College's programs? Okay, so I reached out to them, and I, that's still pending, so for those of you who know people at Champlain College, just circle back around with me. I just barely got my first f foot in the door. Um, but I do know that there is something that's going on over there that will be useful uh, to this type of uh, programming. Uh, again, we just want to train folks, we wanna, and, and then we want to move to a point of train the trainer to be able to move to a point to where we're, we're getting youth coming in and they're, and they're excited and, we're, and they're actually training other youth. Um, of course, um, that, will, um, that will fuel some of our capacity uh, uh, organically. I'm not, um, you know, I'm, there, there's, no, there's no shame in that game uh, because that, that's kind of what we're here for. Um, I'm, I'm excited that folks, these folks that are sitting next to me are not just a, a few youth in uh, Burlington, but at the end of the day, uh, could, you know, it, on some level are actually my colleagues. Um, and I think that's exciting. Um, what is going on here? Um, so so I, I'm going to conclude with just a brief conversation on, um, you know, what the training program looks like because it was defined by my interns over summer. And so some of the language uh, that you see here, um, I think we tweaked it up a little bit. Um, is, is most of it is pretty intentional when you start talking about grassroots and you start thinking about things like community and youth and marginalized community. So these, these are words that were, you know, we really kicked around and then checked and double checked and said, you know, does this sound right? And we're still 
tweaking it, and then there's a sign-up form that we've also created. And we saw that CCTV had already did something similar, so we were appropriating. Um, I like it when black people appropriate white people things. Um, but um, we were appropriating uh, from uh, CCTV uh, to some extent, just, but not really though, because we love CCTV and Travis and all of the work that he's doing over there, and they know what we're doing, and they're helpful in, in the work and, and supportive. And so I, I know that this, this is, this is going to work. Um, I think now it's just a matter of um, tweaking it out and getting the time, because mind you, we're doing a lot of stuff. You know, we stood up two affinity spaces. One of them was because the youth asked for one uh, this year. Um, one is a, an adult affinity space. Uh, we're working on a farm justice program. Wonder what that's all about. <laughs> Wonder what the backstory is there. Um, so there's um, so there's that going on. Um, we have youth movie nights at the Richard Kim Center uh, every uh, like the second and and fourth Fridays as well. So there, and there, so there's a bunch of stuff that's coming out, the after school program, um, Credible Messengers, um, and there, there's more, we can talk more about that. So we're gonna take it to a wrap now, but I wanna just get, you know, get a little chatter in the room and maybe you might have some questions for uh, some of the youth. Um, I've got some backup slides just in case you fail me, um, but there's some, but there's some, I think there's some robust discussion that we've had up until now. I, I really believe that I've seen a few people's eyes light up. Um, I, can, I can read the room pretty good. I told you I have four older brothers. You gotta be able to see the punch coming. Um, but yeah, I'm totally, totally down with having a, you know, answering any questions. Um, but you know, before you ask any, if, if you don't mind it, I, if I could ask you one, I'm just putting a question to the room. Um, and, and yes, I haven't forgotten um, the, uh, the uh, conversation that we're gonna have about what CCTV looks like when we walk in the door. We can also uh, revisit that. Um, but my question to you is more around um, kind of what, if, if there's anything that you've, that you've heard that, is, that could be useful in what it is that you're doing, did you learn anything particularly on the systemic racism side. Uh, and then, you know, these are just, you don't have to answer all of these, but I'm just throwing out some, you know, you can choose A, B, or C. Um, and, and then the other thing is, is um, you know, where do you see this, you know, how do you, how, do you see, how do you see yourself or your organization or folks that you know applying some of the things that we've talked about? And of course, you can just redirect and, and just ask uh, us any questions if you choose to. Mark uh, Crosby from Quincy Access Television in Massachusetts. I just, uh, we have, the city of Quincy recently hired a, a quality and diversity position in the administration, so in the mayor's office. Um, there was, there's a, a larger population of Asians in our city, and mm -hmm. unfortunately they had come under some violence uh, in the past, and prior to this position being a position that was sought after, it was actually there were community meetings where the community wanted help and they needed support. I guess my question after listening to your presentation is somehow talking to this, this position, this person with the quality and diversity mm -hmm. title has been in our studio for an interview, mm -hmm. but that's an interview. So my, as far as action, my thought is how can we work with him and bring more folks into Quincy Access Television to mm -hmm. produce programming on whatever any group wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. so what's what's your name again? Mark Crosby. You're Mark? Hey, you must be a great guy. Well, I work with the other thing. Is I, I love Marks. Seniors. I work with uh, seniors and juniors from the local high schools, too. Yeah. And I think I try to give them meaningful projects to mm -hmm. work on as interns. Mm -hmm. And I've done with Juneteenth. I haven't put together a Juneteenth right, right. Uh, bumper or PSA. Got you. Martin mm -hmm. Luther King, any of those holidays. Got you. But I'm wondering how I can work with this. Oh, I'm thinking of ways to work with this. Yeah, let's, let's, go to, let's go to that. And the, the question is, is really... 
Um, how does Mark, how does Mark work with uh, this newly created position uh, on as far as this? Because the, there's this position that that's new, and and the idea is as if you know they brought him in the studio already. But how do they how do they go about bringing him in and maybe uh, leveraging, if that's okay to say, that relationship to bring in other folks? Is that right? Absolutely. I'm going to go to you. Thank you. Hi, what's your name? My name's Amy Parnell. Amy Parnell in the house. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, I am from, well, I live in Springfield, Vermont, and it sounds why? like... Why? Why? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> a lot of people asked us that when we moved there, but I love it. Um, so I wanted to make a suggestion for your question. Mm -hmm. um, one of the programs that we have at our station um, is through a town political party and they host interviews called Springfield Voices, and they interview different people around the community. So if there's an entity in your community that might want to host interviews, then getting people in to your station for something like that might be a good invitation, not putting the pressure on them to create their own show. So creating the show for them to host? Yeah, just if there's somebody in, in your community that would like to do a talk show or an interview show, have them in maybe suggest some different guests. Another um, thing that's happening in Springfield that's really amazing, our um, town library hosts a series called Community Conversations. They invite in the town manager, the, um, I'm trying, the police chief, the fire chief, just different folks from the community so that, um, and it's open to people to come into the library and be there live and ask questions, but we also broadcast it, or not, we record it and then we post it on social media for people to comment. So those are a couple of ways to engage people. In there you go, Mark. You guys, I mean, you guys are collaborating. I like this, man. We're yeah. we getting <laughs> stuff done in here. And so, while, I, while I'm talking, if I could, can I keep Of course, going? go ahead. So I also, I've been thinking about Bert's question. Um, no, we can't talk about that. Can I no, I'm just joking. Go I've ahead, go ahead. I've been holding it for a while. <laughs> um, and then what, what you said about this isn't going to be accomplished in our lifetime. Correct. I come from a, an education background and mm -hmm. early childhood education in the last five, seven years. Yep. Um, and so a show that we're, another show we're doing is um, I, I have a friend who's a speech therapist and we're, it's word time with Ms. Markey and each... There goes Randy. We lost Randy. It's over now. It's each, over. Each week she focuses on a different letter sound and she reads a book and we make it a point to choose books that have diverse people in them because in Springfield, Vermont, on the main street that you drive into, right across from the rec center, there's a house that's still flying a Confederate flag. And so it's not surprising. I feel like in our community, even though our station is welcoming, maybe the community does not feel safe for somebody to expose themselves by coming in and making a show. So we can be kind of the proxy for that by having diversity represented in other ways, even if mm -hmm. people aren't feeling safe about coming in. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I would repeat some of it, but I'm, I think um, hopefully you might have got most of it because I, I don't even, I don't even want to try to lift that up. Okay. I tried to use my teacher voice. So it would be you, you did use your teacher <laughs> voice. I really appreciate that. Uh, what, are, what are some of the other takeaways and thoughts? Um, I, I wanted to just direct your attention to the slide that's up right now. This is the Richard Kemp Center. So some of the work that, that we've been doing uh, with the Alliance uh, converged with uh, our culture, converged with our youth, and also our, um, our obviously our wellness. And, and I speak of wellness in very, very broad terms. Uh, to, I mean, even to the extent that we're not really doing well until we begin to see um, progress in the eradication of systemic racism across housing, education, employment, health services, access, access to media, and so on and so forth. Um, mental health is really at the center of that. We're, we've got some programming where we're, we're talking about the implementation of a pod for, um, for some uh, clinical services, clinical services to be um, um, pr provided there. Also, uh, group and peer-to-peer -peer networking um, we're, we've planned some services and, and activities around that as well as uh, mental health first aid uh, to our staff and to some of our community members. Uh, everything surround, is, is, you know, surround, is, um, is, I guess, surrounded by a group of community members that come in and support 
uh, to work. The reason why I'm sharing this with you is, is to kind of give you a sense of the, the idea that there's much, much, much more going on um, than, than just a pure play media, per se. And this, um, the work that we're doing as the Alliance and uh, through, the, um, through the Richard Kim Center, all of it must be amplified with media. All of it must be amplified. So it's, so it's, more, it's more of a, yes, media is an apparatus, a tool, a multiplier, um, but, it, but it's also a program. You remember I told you about farm justice. It's also a program uh, where we, we are going to be routing our youth through. And then through that very apparatus, we'll, we'll be able to leverage some of that capacity uh, to augment our own capabilities. Um, but meanwhile, back at the ranch, there's a ton of stuff um, that's going on. Uh, we host the Health Equity Advisory Commission, um, uh, where I'm the co-chair statewide. So we, we, we do some of that programming uh, in the Richard Kim Center. And one of the things that we're also doing is supporting and assisting uh, at-risk and juvenile and justice impacted youth and young adults uh, in this program. Uh, that's a movement, a national movement called Credible Messengers. Um, it's a standardized program and it, it has a lot of moving parts, but really uh, it starts with self-actualization and it comes out with a life plan. And God knows uh, with all of the stuff uh, that we're dealing with as a community uh, here in the state, um, we need this kind of help. But all of this stuff has to be lifted up, uh, has to be lifted up with, uh, with our media capability as well. So this is, uh, again, more uh, of uh, the work that we're doing. I'm going to conclude with um, just um, um, somebody asked me one day, they said, who's your favorite president in, uh, in, um, in and I didn't say Thomas Jefferson, in, in, uh, but I was, it was in the context of the conversation, it was an elderly white woman and two refugee resettlement community folks. One of them was not even from here, was, didn't live here. He was here for a program or something. And they were talking about, she was talking about why, um, she was talking about her desire for the refugee resettlement community and the indigenous African American community to come together, which was kind of offensive to me anyway, because that's my job, right? Um, I don't need a, a white savior to tell me what we need to do as a community. And, if you don't think that I don't see that, then we got bigger problems. Um, but I digress, we'll come back to that. So the conversation went on and she was trying to tell me how, what great a man Abraham Lincoln was. And, um, and at some point I just got so frustrated with the conversation um, that I said, um, I said, you know, I like Eisenhower. So all of them were just flipping out after I said Eisenhower, you know. And, and, but I, actually, I did it strategically as well, because Eisenhower was the one who warned us about the military industrial complex, OK? Um, as I was thinking through the end of this, and I was listening to some programming somewhere else. And I was listening to Becca Ballant this morning. I wrote this after um, I heard her. And she said something very similar to this. Whenever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. That whenever things get so far wrong as to attract their notice, they may be relied on to set them to rights. And on the surface, it sounds reasonable. But this was Thomas Jefferson, who owned slaves. The question was, is, who is people? Because black people wasn't people. 
when Thomas Jefferson was president. We didn't become people until the 14th Amendment. It's still in that struggle. Still in that struggle. Still in that struggle. Amen, brother. And so I leave, I leave you with this because I, I want to take you back to those thoughts on um, those thoughts on um, journalistic objectivity. And I think this is kind of the next level, the, the whole conversation on journalistic objectivity. I didn't want to miss an opportunity here. But this is deep. This statement right here, the context, the person, and how we have a United States representative that represents Vermont today, who threw these same words at you this morning. I'm not mad at Becca, but I'm, I, I know Becca pretty well. But I'm just saying, again, this is media. This is what media, this is how media is wielded. This is, this is how language is used. And when we start thinking about who has power, we start thinking about who has privilege, who is, you know, who is it that's making the decisions on who is important, who is people, who gets to make the decision on trust, whose government are we talking about? In the context where Thomas Jefferson was saying our own government, he was talking about their government, not our government. So it's like one of those things where if we're not careful and if we're not intentional in the work that we're doing, if we're not decisive in the work that we're doing on media justice, then what we'll be doing is we'll be exacerbating a pre-existing condition because we'll just be signing on to something and we'll just be going along to get along and just lifting up whatever is being said hiding behind objectivity and not making an intentional impact to turn this thing around. So um, we're going to take the last, um, we're going to close it there. I, I thank you. I want to I thank, um, first of all, um, Aiden for showing up and, and Amina and, and Jamie, if y'all could just give it up for them alone. No, clap for them like you mean it. Come on. Um, I also want to thank um, Megan uh, for the hard work that you put in to putting this together. Uh, and um, I mean, just the whole, so you, you was working like a, like a, so <laughs> well, from what I saw, see, you made it look, you made it look hard. It's so. not true. She's lying. <laughs> so I, I do want to thank you. Uh, who else in the room was in, was responsible for this conference, putting it, this just the work involved? Who is that? Ralph Jamin. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so. Give it up. <laughs> thank you so much. And um, that's all we have. If can you guys just stick around for uh, like one, like one or two more minutes though, because um, make. Well, well, hold on for a minute. You asked the question, and I wanted to get an answer uh, from you. Did she, she mentioned something about you came over to the studio, and um, I had forgotten about it in the last five minutes. Yeah, you know, um, you talk about systemic racism, um, which in part is about power. Mm -hmm. um, and our physical structures often reinforce systems of power. Mm -hmm. And so when there's intentional design to try and deconstruct that, mm -hmm. um, I take notice. Uh, and one of those is whether or not there is a rectangular space that's enclosed rather than open. And so when you walk into a space that's specifically designed to keep you out, it's got two doors, it's locked, it's secure. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's to hold people in or to hold people out. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
And so when we want to try and create inclusive spaces, if we replicate something that is designed to keep people out, we wonder why there is friction, why we don't have people embracing it and feeling that. Right. And that, that space over there is, is an amazing space. What so they, they I made. part of the intent of the, from the origin story, from the creators who helped hmm. us try to design that space was how do we create these spaces to be more open, that a conversation can happen in a way that's open, that allows organic discussion to happen rather than a controlled power-based discussion, which is a talk show. And so I often suggest to people that they think very critically about a talk show under which there is a given person who remains in power through the control of the microphone or being the host and what that reinforces for anybody else who is that guest. I'm going to take that with me. I, I needed to hear that. Thank you for allowing us to have that uh, last comment. Is that, is that, I also I have a show over, at, at, over there. It's called Just the Position. So I think it's every second Wednesday. And and I just I'm a microphone hog. Exactly. I'm like a pig. Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Okay. Tomorrow Friday morning. Oh yeah, we're done. We're, we've been done. You guys no, nobody's <laughs> nobody's twisting your arm. Get out of here. Nobody's making you stay here. <laughs>